Hey Mustangs, in this video we're going to be reviewing the three types of natural selection. So, in order to really understand these, you have to look back at the bell curve. So if you remember when we talked about the bell curve, um, we take a look at how the individuals spread out uh, based on their traits. Uh, variations for a specific trait, for example. So over here on the y-axis, we have the number of individuals. And on the x-axis, we have the variation of a trait. So the range, uh, the differences within a certain type of trait. And what we see is that if we were to take all the individuals of a species and plot them out, we find that there's more individuals that have an average of a trait um, than the extremes. Okay? And the reason for this has to do with the fact that this average of the trait is probably what's best for survival. And as you move away from whatever the average of that trait is, the chance of survival decreases in both directions. So this is the best variation of the trait to actually have to survive in their environment. So. The first type of selection is directional selection. So directional selection is moving to the extremes of a trait. Um, so natural selection, the environment changes, and now one of the extremes will be favored. Now it's a common misconception with this one. With directional, it can move either direction. In this graph here, we see it moving to the right here. Um, it could move to the left though as well. So let's go ahead, take a look and break down what's going on in this graph. So here we have the number of birds in a population. Here we have the beak size. Now just to make it even more clear, I'm gonna draw beaks down here. So let's say these are small beaks, these are medium sized beaks, and these are large beaks here, okay? And initially in the original environment, having a medium sized beak, let's say, was the best to survive. And that's why we see more individuals. You have less birds, more, 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 more birds. That's why you had most birds had this variation of beak size. But the environment changes. And as a result of that, let's say larger beaks are favored. And if we use the example uh, with the finches on the Galapagos Islands, we could say, oh, maybe they, there was a change in the environment and only large, hard seeds were available. So now these guys have the right trace to survive. So over time, we see these guys start to die out. They can't get enough food. We start to see less and less of these guys because these guys are now more successful. Now this version of the trait is the best to survive. So generations later, we see that most birds have these large honking beaks. These guys are now at the low end of the spectrum. And now, of course, there's gonna be birds with even bigger beaks too, but that's not the best for survival. These guys have just the right traits to survive. Okay. So that's directional selection. Now it could have went the other way. So we could find the curve over here instead um, where it favored the smaller beaks. So I want to be clear on that. So directional, it can move either direction. It can move that way or that way and it favors the extremes on the sides here. All right, stabilizing selection. Stabilizing selection stabilizes the average basically. So when we look here, we have the um, percentage of the population, we have birth, birth mass here. Um, so basically you could think about birth weight. Um, if you look at humans, babies born below a certain weight, especially before we had all the technology and medical stuff that we have nowadays, were often too small to survive and they would often die. To the right of the curve here, this is bigger babies. Um, bigger babies, again, before medical technology and everything, if they were too big, they can kill the mom and, they, and that could result in their death as well. So stabilizing selection is where the average traits are more favored and there's less of the extremes. So you can't go as far out when there's stabilizing selection. There's something about that trait that if you go too far past the average, then um, that decreases the chance of survival in, in large amounts. All right, and then finally, um, we have disruptive selection. So in disruptive selection, this is gonna favor the extremes rather than the average. And in this case, this is different from directional. It favors both extremes. So we have both extremes here, okay? So let's do our example once again with the bird beaks. So here's the number of birds in the population. And I'm gonna draw these small beaks here, medium beaks there, and larger beaks here. 
And in this case, remember that dotted line represents the original population here. The medium was the best trait to have, but then the environment changed. And let's say smaller seeds and larger seeds were the best available. And these birds that had smaller beaks were better at getting the smaller seeds. These birds that had the larger beaks were better at getting the larger seeds. And they outcompeted these guys with the middle, the average middle sized beaks, uh, medium sized beaks. Okay. So originally, yeah, they were, they did have the best trait to survive. But now in this new environment, the extremes have the better traits to survive. So these guys outcompete the medium sized beak and you start to see more and more birds with small beaks, more and more birds with large beaks, and less with the medium-sized beak. So we see the kind of this roller coaster shape going on, and it's favoring the extremes. So in any case with selection, um, it's gonna change the bell curve. As environments change, you're gonna see that variations within a trait will change, and that's the essence of evolution, it's the essence of change, um, that the variations that you see in a trait, some will be more favored than others, and that will lead to change in a species over time.